Good morning, good morning. Hallelujah. Good to see everybody today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Turn around. Look someone in the eye. If you mean this, and say, I'm glad you're here. Amen. Huh? Glad you're here. Hallelujah. You know, it wouldn't be the same without you. Amen. Just as your body is incomplete, if something's amputated, when you're not assembled in a body, the body's incomplete without you. And together we make up this beautiful, beautiful picture called the body of Christ. What an awesome thing that is, amen. What an awesome place to be in Christ, in Christ. This morning we're going to stir you up a little bit. This is uh, September and I always like to recap and stir you up in the area of vision. And vision is very important. Vision is really what you see in the future. It's a desired thing that you see and that you're living for and that you're striving for and that you're going for. In Proverbs 29, it tells us, without vision, the people perish. A more accurate translation of that is, without revelation, people cast off restraint. It takes a vision, it takes a revelation, it takes a picture of the future. The picture you see is the person you'll be. How you see yourself in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, how you see your family, that's your vision. Where do you wanna be in five years? Where do you wanna be in 10 years? What's the hope you have? What's your expected end? Because the scripture says God will give you a hope of an expected end. And then as Christians, we go a step further than the people of the world. The people of the world, they pretty much have a vision that is limited to life, the lifetime here on earth. But our vision is expanded because we take off the limits of time as Christians. When we talk about vision, we're talking about stepping into eternity. We're not just talking about what's it going to be 5, 10, 20, 30 years and then the grave. We're talking about what's it going to be on the earth in preparation for eternity. Because everything about our vision on earth should be qualified by how will that affect eternity. And everything on earth is nothing more than prep school for eternity. This is prep school. This is where we're being prepared. It's where we're being tested. It's where we're being tried. It's where our faith being tested like gold is being revealed as real or not real. It's where we have a go or no go from God. When we die, we either get a go or a no go. We we either move forward with him for eternity or we're bound to the devil's hell and the lake of fire that was not even created for us. That wasn't God's intention when he created that. It was for the devil and his angels. Only man can decide to go there. So when we talk about vision, we're not talking about, well, I got a vision, you know, and this many years I'm going to have the American dream. No, let's get a vision for where we're going to be in the eternal scope of things. And let's keep working for that. Because as long as your vision is eternity, you'll never stop. If your vision is, my vision and my goal is make $100,000, make a million dollars, have this, have that. Well, then what? My vision is to get married, have a couple of kids, live my life. And then what? Die? See, that's the neat thing about us. Death is not our end, it's our beginning. We live differently. The reason we, we are restrained in our lives, we've been talking about this the last couple services, vision restrains us. The Bible says where there's no revelation, people cast off restraint. But revelation or revealed knowledge causes us to be restrained. 
It keeps us from doing some things and it keeps us doing some things. It restrains us from things and it restrains us for things. And so when we talk about vision, there's two kinds of real vision. And when you're a Christian, you have your personal vision, your family vision. Everybody should have a family vision. Why? Because we all have to discover how we're to make a way in the earth. When we get born again, it's not just kumbaya, group hug, grab you a harp, hang on a cloud, and, and wait for Jesus to come back. When we get born again, now we've got to learn how to navigate through this lifetime, how we're going to have provision. We got a vision, but we got to have provision for the vision. We, we've got to find source and resource. We got to figure out, okay, how am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to make a living? How am I going to feed my children? How am I going to make sure my wife is, is taken care of? And how am I going to develop a way to have an inheritance that will even reach down into my grandchildren and maybe my great-grandchildren. That's personal vision. How am I going to live? How am I going to make, how, what means am I going to have? Where am I supposed to be and what am I supposed to do? Personal vision. When we add God into the mix of personal vision, now we add a degree of difficulty to this maneuver because now it's no longer just what I want, but it's what he wants. Now we have to factor in the, the fact that we have an eternal destiny and that there's a predestination for each one of us in the sense of God had a plan for your life. Now we have to uncover, discover, and sometimes recover that plan. We've got to try to get in step with the Lord. So now it takes adding a, a degree of difficulty. Now it's no longer, well, I want to be this or I want to do that. Now we add in the mix, well, what does God, what did he design me for? Many people live and die without ever discovering personal vision in the sense of a kingdom vision. They're governed by their own selfish desires and motives. Never yet fully capturing what God has for them. Even in ministry, we can be governed by selfish motives and desires. Not yet fully understanding what God has for us. As a young man preparing for ministry, I had all my plans all laid out. I told everybody, this is what I am. This is what I'm going to do for God. I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going to go to Thailand to be a missionary. That's what I told everybody. Then one day God stepped into the room and said, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. He said, no, you're not. We argued for about a year. He said, you're going back to Jackson, Ohio. I said, no, I'm not. I said, Lord, I'd join the army to leave that city. I would never go back there. I hated my hometown. We got any hometown haters up in the house this morning? Come on, somebody. Probably about half the teenagers here. I can't wait to get out of this armpit of Parkersburg. Well, I got news for you. News flash everywhere you go. There you are. You got your own pit with you. I, I had to learn that. Now, it took me several years. I had to live in a couple of different states and two or three countries before I realized everywhere I went, there I was. I kept thinking a location would change me. It didn't. I was the same. I remember when I left Jackson, Ohio as a 19-year-old man, I looked at my friends and I knew I had something inside me that said there's more to life than partying. But I had this loyalty to friends that was stronger than blood. We were a gang, man. I'm telling you, my loyalty to my friends was stronger than my loyalty to my parents. They controlled me and I controlled them. We had this unholy covenant of failure together. And I knew I had to break out. And I, I, I'll really tell you this. The reason I hated my hometown is because I hated what I was in my hometown. I hated who I was in my hometown. I didn't want to be what I was, but I didn't have any way out of it except join the army. And then I thought, once I join the army, I'm finally going to be what I want to be and do what I want to do. And I got in the army, and after six months, I looked around, and I had the same friends. 
And so I thought, what I need to do is move to another nation. And so I went all the way across the ocean to another nation and another culture. And in six months, I looked around, and guess what? I was me again. Everywhere I went, there I was. Everywhere I went, there I was. I had no vision, and I was perishing. I wasn't being restrained. I was being stoned. <laughs> You know, one thing I said, I'll never forget, I was working in, in uh, Fort Worth, Texas on the F-16 project, and I'll never forget, I was a stoner. I was high every day and every night. I lived to get high, and I was one of those stoners. We had two categories of stoners when I was a kid. We, we used to call it like this. Either they can keep it together or they can't keep it together. Now, if you were a stoner who could keep it together, what you were qualified is you can keep and live two lives. You can lie. You can, you can be one person at one minute, but yet you, you, know, you can still be the party over here. But then you know how to get it together enough to make it through life without completely being a train wreck. Then we had the crowd that couldn't keep it together. They're the ones that ended up in jail all the time. DUIs, you know, losing jobs, losing homes, losing families. So we had those two categories of partiers. I always stayed right on the boundaries of the one who could keep it together. I could maintain a job, live two lives. I was a liar. Everything in my life was a lie. And I'll never forget, man, I was working this job. Had a good job in the natural. Had a good job. But inside there was always this thing of, there's got to be more than this. Okay, I got the house now. I got the wife now. I got the car now. I got the job now. I got, but I got the same group of friends I had in high school. Because there's something else. There's something missing in my vision. There's something I was created for that this ain't working. It ain't working for me. And that longing laid in my heart for year after year after year. And at the age of 24, I met the only thing that could fulfill that longing, and that was Jesus. And for the first time in my life, I was no longer living by a loyalty or a code to my friends. But I stepped into a covenant with God. And from that day on, I looked at my friends and said, I love you, but I choose him. I looked at my wife and I said, love you, but I choose him. I looked at every relationship in my life and said, if you ever put me between you and God, I choose God. And I'll just let you know that right up front. And everything changed. Everything changed. And so then out of that new vision, I began to have a desire to go help people and to give my life helping other people. But I had a favorite place to do it. And it sure wasn't my hometown. Sure wasn't my hometown. So even in spiritual vision, here's what you'll find. When you get born again and you really get on fire for God and you really get filled with God's spirit, a lot of times what you think will be your vision for life is still not your vision. It's a discovery process. And you know, it's amazing. After I argued with God for a year about what I was going to do or where I was going to be, when I finally came to a conclusion I wasn't going to win the argument, I submitted. I submitted. And when I submitted, that meant I yielded to the will of another. That's what the word submit means. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. I ain't submitting that knuckle dragger. Are you kidding me? He's a caveman with clothes on. Well, you shouldn't have married him. Bumbelina, you shouldn't have married him. I can't help it that you chose Bobo instead of Boaz. I'm sorry. But now you're in a covenant to submit. Well, I'm smarter than him. You should have thought of that before you said I do. Amen. But I had to submit to God. Now, here's one thing I found out in my vision was once I said yes and once I stopped fighting, all of a sudden inside I began to change. Everything began to change when I submitted to the mission of God. 
I came into submission. That meant my mission came under his mission. Submission, submit, yielding to the will of another. That's not fun, but that's the call of the kingdom. And so I came under the submission of Christ and everything began to change in my life as I assume things have already begun to change dramatically in your life if you've submitted to the call of God. And then we go through a process of learning and growing and discovery. It's really an adventure if you look at it that way. You can look at the vision for your life as, oh my gosh, uh, uh, this, is, this is horrible. Or you can look at it as an adventure. I chose the latter, glass half full. You can look at it and say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Or you can look at it and say, we'll figure it out. Let's see what's next. And we don't, you know, this thing didn't come with a set of instructions. You know, you know how you get those directions that are written in China? And it should just make sense when you're trying to put that thing together. But it's like... Lost in translation. That's kind of how it is when God as a spirit is trying to speak to us as baby spirits. And we haven't quite learned all of his spiritual language yet. And so we're still trying to say, what's, he's, he's trying to, we're trying to communicate what's wrong. And we're like, I, 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 and, and we're not having that full development of spiritual communication and communion and language yet. So there's a struggle in learning to walk in the spirit. There's a struggle in learning to grow. And so far for me, it's lasted about 33 years. I mean, I'm really, I would say, a novice in understanding spiritual communications after 33 years. I wish it was like English and, or another uh, known language of man. But see, we're trying to learn how to be led by the Spirit of God. We're not any longer. We're trying to step out of being controlled by what we see, hear, touch, feel, taste, smell. And now we're trying to go by an unction of an invisible force. And then we're trying to determine is the unction that is with me, is this subjective or objective? Is this me or is this God? You know, I'm sure everyone was in the room this morning and, and, and everybody has had a, if we went through and interviewed every one of you and said, please give an explanation of what you've experienced in the last one hour and 14 minutes. Do you know we'd get a different interpretation from every one of you? Why? Because it's, there's a lot of subjectivity. See, there might have been a song you didn't, that wasn't one of your favorites, so you just kind of turned that off. But for someone else, that was my favorite song. For one person, it's like, well, that didn't really do much for me. And for another person, it was like, my God, that was awesome. The message this morning, for some of you, this will be like on target. You'll be thinking, my God, he's preaching right to me. And others will be saying, come on, move on, Dave. Get to the good stuff. The kingdom of God, is, it, it's, it's objective and it's subjective. The vision that we walk in, it's personal and it's corporate. You know how God really began to birth a personal vision in me? when it comes to my home because I'm a corporate leader, but I got a family too. I'm a corporate leader, but I'm a husband. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a guy who has a calling to plant and establish churches. That's an apostolic calling. I shepherd the flock of God. I'm a bishop and I'm, I'm an overseer in the house of God. But I'm also a dad and a grandpa. So I got to have a vision, not only for how to lead the church, but how to keep my wife smiling. How to keep my children, you know, to somewhat being a, a, a spiritual, not only a spiritual mentor, but a, a life coach with my kids. What do you think, Dad? Well, I'm not pastor now, I'm dad. Even though I want those, those lines to be blended and so we're all living in this. And, and a, many, many, many years ago, I was reading the scriptures and I ran across this psalm, Psalm 128. If you have your Bible this morning or a way to look at the Bible, whether it's on your 
iPad or your iPhone or whatever, please read it with me. We'll put it up on the screen for anyone who didn't bring a way to read it with you. This was, I remember the day God gave this to me and he set a personal vision that I have lived now for these last 30 years. And it's been amazing. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy. And it shall be well with you. Your wife, she'll be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. And the Lord bless you out of Zion and may keep you and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace upon Israel. When I read that many, many years ago, I wasn't a father. I was a brand new husband. But God gave me a vision of a blessed life. And he told me how to do it. Fear God and walk in his ways. And he gave me an expected end for my obedience. Now, it didn't all go according to my plan. But after 30 years, you know, here I read this promise of God for my personal vision, for my life. And 30 years later, I'm going to sit down with my children and my grandchildren, and I'm going to eat dinner. And what a beautiful thing to see another grandchild taking his first steps. And what a great thing to hear my wife telling other people, my husband is a man of God and bragging on me. You really want to know what someone's like? Ask their husband or their wife. Ask their children. I still read my Father's Day cards. And when I read and my daughters say, Dad, you're awesome. I don't take that as a conceit or an arrogance. I take it as I just did what the book said. I just followed the directions. I just did what the book said. I just lived a life where the fear of God restrained and controlled me. And I've tried my best to obey his commandments and live in his laws. I've tried, as the psalmist said, to let his light and his law lead my steps and guide me. His law is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I say that to every young couple, every single young person who's aspiring to one day have a blessed home and a blessed family. Just follow the book. Just walk in the vision that God put before you. That this shall be the man who fears the Lord. The woman who fears the Lord. Who walks in his ways. And, and you know, that personal vision is awesome. And every one of us have an, you know, some people stumble through life without purpose. Very few people really make a strong endeavor to learn to hear the voice of God. Or they allow someone else to be the voice of God for them. And they become codependent on some other human. And then at the end of the day, he says, all they're doing is blaming someone else for their mess. So I'm like, well, you should have took responsibility. You should have crawled in your prayer closet and said, I ain't coming out till I know the will of God. I took these things that serious, and I think that's one reason I've had an expected end in this thing. Now, I've had bumps along the way, as all of us will. I've had tribulation, affliction. All of us will experience these things in life. But as a whole... When I lay my head down at night, I'm never concerned about me. I may lose some sleep for other people, but not for myself. I'm not sitting around in a pity party today. I'm sitting around saying, I did what the book says, and I got what the book says I have. I followed the way of God. And I've, the way of God leads you to where you're supposed to be. And it works. Amen. It works. 
So that's a, that's a beautiful personal vision that I encourage everyone to discover. I, decur- I, I, I would tell everyone, especially if you're a younger Christian, or no matter how old you are, if you still look at me and say, I don't know what God created me for, then you're still in the discovery process. And don't get discouraged and quit, but keep pounding heaven's door. Keep asking the Father. And don't exalt it to something of, you know, a lot of people, they, they, they think they haven't found the will of God until they're like some superstar or something. My God, you're, the will of God for you may be to influence one human being on the earth, but if you've done the will of God, you've done a great work on the earth. Don't exalt yourself. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Keep pressing. Jesus said, everyone who seeks will find. Everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Everyone who asks, it will be given. We take those promises, those great, Peter said, great and exceeding precious promises. And by these promises, we become partakers of the divine nature. That's what Peter said. And so we look into these promises and we knock on heaven's door. Father, what's, the des- what's your desire for me in this? Father, what's your desire for me in this? Father, where am I supposed to be right now? Father, what am I supposed to be doing right now? And then we look and we listen and we wait in the presence of God. And then once we believe we've received an answer, because it's a spiritual communication, that answer itself must be tested by fire. Because there are many voices in the world, the scripture says. There are some voices that would lead you astray. I've always said it like this. Whenever a voice tells me what I want to hear, I usually discount it. Whenever a voice tells me about a future that ends in me being great, I usually discount it. I usually question any voice that tells me how wonderful I am. Because flattery is one of the enemy's greatest resources to lead people, manipulate people. So I listen to the voice of a father saying, you know, you could really do better. You really need to fix this and change this. I listen to the voice of a father who is constantly correcting me and leading me along the way I'm supposed to walk. A lot of people, I hate to say it, are legend in their mind. They're a legend in their mind. But we've got to get down to where we find the will of God in our spirit. And then learn to walk in the divine contentment of that in our personal vision. Amen. Well, Dave, are you saying I'm not supposed to have any aspirations? No. I'm saying every motive has to be pure. Why do you want that? Whenever you say, I want that, now go the next step. Why do you want that? What's the motive behind it? To help more people? Pure and godly. To be a greater blessing? Pure and godly. To be a greater servant in the kingdom? Pure and godly. To be able to reach out and to do more, to bring the message of Christ to the earth? Pure and godly. I've been amazed over the years at how many people have aspired and said, God's given me a vision to become wealthy so that I can finance the kingdom, and they get the wealth and goodbye to the kingdom. Goodbye to the kingdom. And they build their own kingdom. How many, how many uh, young, talented people who aspired to spread the message of the gospel when they got a little fame It went to their head, and now they're legends in their own mind. And they play for the crowd instead of leading and following the cloud. Think about it. Personal vision is powerful. Then we have the corporate vision. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. For you've not come to the mountain that can be touched And that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken anymore. 
for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot through with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. Now, if you're not a Bible scholar today or if you've not read the Old Testament, you'll be saying, what the heck are you talking about? When God gave the law to the children of Israel in the wilderness on Mount Sinai, he wanted to talk to the whole congregation. But he gave them boundaries and he said, you cannot cross these boundaries. And when God spoke, it was so terrifying. The people cried out to Moses, tell him to stop. You go hear what he says and then you come and tell us. Tell God to stop. We can't stand it. He's scaring us to death. And the Bible says that's not the way it is anymore. That's not what this corporate vision is about. But it says concerning us, but you've come to Mount Zion, not Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where the law was given and a covenant was cut and made with the children of Israel. But today we're under a new covenant. We call it the New Testament. We're under a covenant of Jesus Christ. We're no longer under the covenant of the law of Moses where we must keep the Levitical code. But instead, he said, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven. Turn around and ask the person beside you, are you registered? Hmm? Are you registered? If they say no, say, can I pray with you right now? Would you like to get your name registered in heaven? Amen. You mean you got to be registered to get in the church? Yes. You got to be registered in heaven. We take roles on earth. But it's not, it's not a, a tablet or a computer in this building that's going to get you to heaven. If your name's in our computer, it's one thing to be in the rock's book of life. It's another thing to be in the lamb's book of life. Amen. Amen. I believe there'll be people who have taken membership here will never make heaven. Why? Because they walked away from God. So membership, number one, primarily has to be the universal church of the living God. There's only really one church on planet Earth. It's the body of Christ. We break up and meet in local assemblies, and you can attend the local assembly of your choice. But the bottom line is, we're in this new covenant of Mount Zion. We're now, we're no longer, I mean, I've been to Jerusalem a couple times, and it's a cool thing to go see the dead stones, but today we're assembled to see the living stones. The real Jerusalem is right here in this room. The real Jerusalem is not in Israel. The real Jerusalem, just like the true children of Abraham, are not people who have Jewish DNA and genetics. They're people who have faith in Jesus Christ. These are the true children of Abraham. Whether you're Jewish or German, whether you're Irish or Polish, whether you're Mexican or Spanish, or whether you're Bulgarian, we are the true children of Abraham if we have faith in Jesus Christ. There's no more one-upmanship because I belong to a certain country or have a certain DNA. Now we have a new spiritual DNA. We've been adopted as sons and daughters. And the Bible says even the natural sons have been cast out and you've been grafted in. You're more a son of, an, of Abraham than a person with natural Jewish blood who does not have faith in Jesus Christ, who's not messianic. We got this new Jerusalem now we live in. We were getting ready to go to Israel, and I was contacted by a friend of mine, and he said, I'm putting together a tour, and, and I'm putting together about 12 pastors, and I'd like you to come with us. And we're not going to Israel to go to the, see the Holy Temple here and the Catholic Church here and the Catholic Church here, and here's the, the church of the, this and the church of that. He said, we're not going to the church of the Holy Sepulchor, and we're not going to the Via Della Rosa. He said, we're going on a Living Stones tour. We're going to go meet the Messianic pastors. We're going to meet the Russian pastors who are living now in a relationship with Christ and are breeding revival in the nation of Israel. And so I said, I'm in, man. 
And you know why he developed that tour? Because he used to lead religious tours to Israel just like a lot of other ministries, and there's nothing wrong with that. Everyone ought to go and see. It's a beautiful experience. But one day he was in Israel, and one of the Israeli pastors said, you all Americans, you all come to see the dead stones, but you never come to see the living stones. You all come to see temple ruins instead of seeing what God's building in, in Israel today because there's a revival in Israel. There's a move of God in Israel. Now we have friends over there. And now we're helping to them pave the way. We're sending money to help these Jewish pastors do what God's called them to do in that land. And it's incredible when you see it. But we're just as much Jerusalem as our friends who are sitting this, this day in Jerusalem worshiping. We're in a new Jerusalem, a heavenly one, an innumerable company of angels. Yeah, there's a lot of demons. There's twice as many angels. Amen. Every time you get too focused on demons, just remember for every devil there's two angels. And only take one angel to bind all the demons. Amen. And I'm going to take one angel, Michael, one angel. He'll take Satan, lock him up and his minions in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Only one angel. So we've got an innumerable company of angels worshiping with us here every time we assemble and meet. To the general assembly in the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. That's who we are today. Registered in heaven, sons and daughters of the Most High God, men who by faith have been made perfect, men who are now adding our obedience to life to our faith and walking out a call of God on earth to meet and to share this message of the gospel wherever we can be given opportunity, praying for an open door, not only to the Ohio Valley, but to everywhere God will give us that influence and opportunity to share his word. That's who we are and that's what we're doing. He goes on to say, to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Just say this with me. It's not about me specifically, but it is about him. I'm part of the process, but it's all about him. And the scripture calls it this way, that Christ may be formed in you. You know what we're really looking to see? We're looking for you to morph into Jesus. Mm -hmm. We're looking for that metamorphosis. We're looking for that beautiful picture of Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're looking to see you separated from your defiled nature and embracing a brand new spirit and a brand new nature and living out of a brand new heart that is righteous and holy and lives in the fear of God and the celebration of his commandments. That's what we're looking for. Looking unto Jesus, the Bible says, the author and the finisher of our faith. Everybody say, I'm in the process. He's working and molding me. From the inside out, he's forming me. He's chiseling me. And some days it hurts, and some days it feels good. Hurts more than it feels good. He's constantly trying to form the image of the firstborn that I can be among his brethren. That's what it's all about, guys. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, the sprinkling and of the blood sprinkling that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. What's that mean? What bloods, what, let me ask you a question, Bible scholars. What did Abel's blood speak? What did it cry out? Remember? What did God say? He heard the blood of Abel. He heard it and it said it cried out. You know what it cried out? Vengeance. Vengeance. The blood of Abel cried out. I heard the blood of your brother crying out. You know what his blood really cried out? Judge Cain, he killed me. What are you going to do about this? That's Abel's blood. The strength of Abel's blood is in the law. 
But he said, now we got a blood that speaks a better thing. You know what this blood cries? Where's this blood put? Where did God say, Jesus, my son, when you come up here after they've killed you, you got a place to put your blood. Where did he put his blood? Did he put his blood in judgment or did he lay it on the mercy seat? He laid it on the mercy seat. So the blood of Abel cried, kill them all. And the blood of Jesus said, save them. They don't know what they're doing. The blood of Jesus cries mercy. Give them one more chance. The blood of Abel says, cut down the tree and its root. The blood of Jesus says, wait, give me another year. Let me work on it. Let me, let me till around it. Let me try to get some, let, hold, give me one more year with the tree. And the Lord of the harvest, the scripture says, is long suffering. We still got saints in heaven crying out, vengeance. But the blood of Jesus says, hold on, give me another year. I believe the reason we're still here is because he said, give me another year. I believe that. I believe God's still working in us and on us. See that you not, do not refuse him who speaks. Who's he who's speaking? Now, Jesus is saying, have mercy. And we have mercy. Not to a point of error. Not a perverted mercy. But a mercy that says, if you're willing, man, we'll give you another chance. You be in this church very long, you're going to see a lot of people come and go. And there's a lot of people say to me, are you really going to give that knucklehead another chance? Yes. Why? He asked. And 70 times 7, I'll believe in you again. You screw up, you get up, you fess up, you grow up, we'll believe in you again. We're going to keep following that blood cloud. Now, if you walk out and you're unrepentant and you, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you there. But I'm going to keep on keeping on. I'm going to keep believing God and I'm going to keep believing the blood and I'm going to keep doing what this scripture says. I'm not going to refuse him who speaks. And then it goes on to give us a little stern warning about not taking uh, an advantage of this and letting this become a license. And don't be careful now when we start talking about the mercy and grace of God. We got to understand what the purpose is. It says, see, the, you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks in heaven? If we turn away from his commandments, if we stop fearing and following, we're given the same warning. This grace opportunity is here, but you've got to follow it. whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised saying, yet, yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. There's a good explanation. Why is all this happening? We got to find out, because here's the thing, guys. Here in just a couple of weeks, there's going to be leaves trying to hold on to limbs. And the wind's going to blow, and the dead leaves are going to be blown off, and the leaves that have life are going to hold on. And you know, God has a way of testing faith, whether it's genuine or real. And the wind blows, and the leaves that are dead are blown off. But the leaves that are alive hold on to the branch. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And every branch that abideth in me bringeth forth his fruit. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man who walks in God's ways and walks in God's word and walks in God's counsel. Why? He says, he'll be like that tree planted by the rivers of water who will bring forth his fruit in his season if we obey and walk in the, the Lord's ways. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. 
Almost every week we have to talk to you guys about reverencing the house of God. Especially the, the millennials and the newer generation. They've lost all sense of reverence for God. Why? Because preachers stop preaching about holiness and reverence. There's a reverence to God. He's to be respected. He ain't your homeboy. He ain't your bud. He ain't your, you know, just, he ain't one of the, the brothers or the sisters. He's the firstborn. He's the father of spirits. He's a consuming fire. And that's how we walk with him. And for some of you, you get so casual. See, there was a time in church where we became so reverent, we weren't real anymore. But then we can become so real, we're no longer reverent. When we become so reverent, we're no longer real. That's an act. But when we become so real, we're no longer reverent. That's a misconception. So we want you to be able to come into the house of God and have a comfort level. But at the same time, we want you to come into the house of God saying, you are representatives of Jesus Christ and you're setting an example by your conversation, by how you walk, how you live, how you move, how you act, how you speak. If you want to walk around here with a tongue that slices and dices everything you don't quote agree with, you're going to be marked in the house of God. If, if, if you're going to walk around here and say, I'll do anything I want, any way I want, you're going to be marked in the house of God as someone that's irreverent. You have no fear of God. And so in a corporate vision, we're trying to maintain a house of God, but yet order. We're trying to maintain a flow of the Spirit, but yet not confusion. And it's a difficult walk, man. It's like walking that tightrope. And, and the way you walk is like this. Not like this. When you walk, there's a balance of nature. Here's the balance of nature of the corporate vision. Evangelism, discipleship. Evangelism, discipleship. Evangelism, discipleship. Win the lost, train them. Win the lost, train them. Win the lost, train them. You get too heavy handed over here, and you'll get inbred. I was in a conversation with a guy the other day. He said, a, a guy called him and made this statement. He said, Our church has a budget of $2 million a year. We got about 400 members and we've not seen a soul saved in 13 months. Oh, they're in Comfortville, man. They're in Pleasantville. They're in Pleasantville. See, they, they've learned how to only, you know, they, they've got a group of people that are just alike and they, they filter out anyone that makes anyone uncomfortable. You're not really welcome here. Like a man walked in our office one day and, and uh, he was talking to us and, and uh, Dennis and I and he sat there and he was a leader. He was a leader. And he walked in and he talked about he had, he had visited a church down the street here. And because he had two tattooed up arms and, and kind of, you know, he looked like more of a street guy than a church guy. He said that one of the leaders of the church come up and put their arm around him as he was walking out after service and said these words to him, you know, you'd probably be more comfortable down there at the rock. <laughs> and you know what that man said? That man said, I'm here this morning to tell you that was five years ago and I didn't come to the rock. I never went back to another church. I never went back to another church. I don't ever want to be that leader that puts his arm around somebody that's not like me and says, you need to really go to church somewhere else. 
If you're that, you know, <laughs> I never forget, Gary, I love to pick on you, man. You're, you're, you're a man after my own heart. And Gary Nangle came in, and he was a little bit like that back in the day. He had lived in a sanitized congregation <laughs> where you were sprayed with Lysol when you walked in the door. They checked you for fleas and ticks. You weren't allowed into the children's church unless you met the current GPA and the, you know. And, and I forget, Gary walked in and he, he was checking our church out because he was shopping, him and Nancy. Nancy, she kind of sit back and let her husband lead, but he stood against that back wall like this for service after service. After about two months, he walked up to me and he said, Pastor? You know what you got here? I said, no, Gary, what? He said, you got a bunch of misfits. And I looked at him, I said, and you fit right in, sir. And he ain't, he, I can't run him off now. He said, you got a bunch of misfits. There ain't nobody normal here. I said, amen, brother. And he was right. And see, some people, they come in and they want normal so bad. They can't evangelize. Because folks don't come in normal. We try our best to normalize them, but it takes years. <laughs> My God, it takes years to get some folks to take a bath. <laughs> if it takes me six months to get you to wear deodorant, how am I going to help you to stop cussing? If we can't get some people to walk in natural tendencies, then we got to talk about supernatural tendencies. Everybody say evangelism, evangelism. discipleship. discipleship. Catch the fish, fish. clean the fish. <laughs> Throw the bad fish away. That's what Jesus said, you remember that? He said the kingdom of God is if a man threw out a dragnet and he brought it in and he kept the good fish and he threw the bad fish away. Some people don't realize that some fish are a bad fish. There's some people you got to look at them, you got to say, you ain't welcome here. Why? Because you're going to violate somebody. You can't be trusted. You're an enemy. You got a heart of a devil. And there are times where you have to do that. We don't like that, and we don't want to do that, and we're very cautious. Man, before I live, it takes a lot for David Chisholm to look at someone and say, you have an evil heart. I always look at people more in the sense of, you're broken, not bad. But sometimes folks are just bad. They can't come under government. And so they got to be thrown out. You got to tell them, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Get out. We don't like that. We don't ever want to do that to another human being. But we'll protect the flock from wolves. Because the scripture warns over and over, there's a time where ravenous wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And with flatteries, they will seduce followers after themselves. You got to watch those spirits that come up to you and say, I think you'd do a better job than the pastor does. You better mark that one. That's a wolf right there. You better mark that one that tries to flatter you and tell you how wonderful you are. You should be this and you should be that. Watch that flattery. Don't ever forget. Exhortation is to put something within you. Flattery is to get something from you. There's a different motive between flattery and exhortation. There's a different motive. Flattery always means I'm manipulating you so in the future there's a gain for me in that. And if I can get you in charge of something, then I can, I've already proven I can manipulate you and then I'll have my way in and out. We gotta be cautious these things. These are real in the house of God. And I have people around me that are much stronger discerners than I am. I tell people, man, it's hard for me to see evil in anybody. I got some folks around here, you can't see good in anyone. <laughs> you think everybody's evil. I mean, there's people have come to me about you. Some of you. Who am I talking about? Only God knows. <laughs> I'll never tell. 
I've had people come in and say, so-and-so's a wolf. And I said, no, they're not. They're, they just got, she's a Jezebel. No, she's a cleric personality. She's never going to change that. She is who she is. God made her that way. If God didn't want strong-willed women, why would he have put that personality in them? Any woman that's got a strong personality, she's a Jezebel. No, she's not. Come on, man. Let's not demonize everyone that don't, quote, measure up to your level of sanctification. But at the same time, there's some folks that need demonized. Because there is an evil heart. And boy, that's rough. But that's part of building in the house of God. And that's why we got to remember our God, we are to serve accept, acceptably with reverence. We reverence the presence of God. We reverence the house of God. We give honor where honor is due. We remember those who rule over us. The Bible says you ought to obey them as long as what they're telling you is godly and right. Well, I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't trusting any man. Well, you better trust somebody or you're going to live in a real small world and you may be right but lonely. You may be right. Bless God, I'm right. And you're sitting in your house alone while the church moves on and wins the world. You're sitting in your house alone being right, becoming a secret internet prophet. Okay, Matthew chapter 20. When we talk about building the house of God and when we talk about corporate vision, our ambition to build the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not so we can trend on Twitter. It's not so we can say we got the largest congregation in town and the most money in the prettiest building. That's not why we do this. We don't do this for the applause of men. And if you're here this morning and you say, I want to be a leader. I want to be a minister in the house of God. Then you've just asked for a baptism of suffering. And Jesus prophesied about you. And I'm going to read you his prophecy today. Who in this house would say with me, Daniela, what I'm saying is not wrong. Don't be reluctant. It's a gift. It's, it's a, an appointed position, but if you're here this morning, you say, I do want to be a leader in the house of God. Lift your hand. I want to be a leader. Now, not everyone's called to lead, else we'd have no followers. But you say, I want to be a leader in the house of God. Well, God puts that desire in people. Now, notice not every hand went up. Some may have been in a little false humility. I ain't going to say that about myself. No, you need to say what God says about you. If God put leadership in you, you need to lead. And you don't be ashamed of that. And you don't walk in a false humility of that. But at the same time, you're not self-appointed and self-anointed. You walk in a kingdom where a king delegates his authority through his delegates. And so we've got to remember that. So Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to her, him with her sons, kneeling down, asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you don't know what you ask. See, that's one thing about all of us. We've got to remember something. We don't always see the big picture, even though we think we do. Have enough humility to realize you don't know it all. And you don't see it all. And you sure enough better not be telling it all. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized? with the baptism that I am baptized with and they said to him we are able oh snap <laughs> did anybody see some pride and arrogance manifest in some young believers who were called to lead notice these men had already been chosen as to be one 
or two of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The highest rank in the kingdom of God was just given to them, but that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. They said, we are able. And Jesus, I'm sure inside he went, oh, you should not have said that. Because now I have to deal with this spirit of pride. He said, okay, you will indeed <laughs> drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. Wow. You know, it's pretty bad when you ask for greatness and you're promised suffering without the greatness. Be careful what you ask for leaders be careful what you wish for leaders ministry is the highest highs and the lowest lows on the planet because all of our highs are eternal and all of our lows are eternal we carry a weight in ministry that other human beings if I'm a supervisor down at the plant and I fire someone that's it if I cause one of these little ones to stumble I'm dealing with an eternal consequence. I'm dealing with an eternal consequence, not only for them, but for me. If I cause one because of my mouth or because I can't control what I say or my tongue is a fire, and I cause one of these little ones to be offended for my sake, not the kingdom's sake, for my sake, I got to stand before God with possibly blood dripping off my hands and give an account for an eternal soul that I led out of the house of God. Highest highs, oh, they ain't nothing like being in the anointing. My God, when the power and the spirit of God are flowing with you, you're Superman. You, you, you're living a dream, but man, you walk down off that, away from that place of teaching or preaching or exhortation, or prophesying and you walk back out into that hallway and you just you again and then you get bombarded and then you got to hear not only how everybody else doesn't think you ever do anything right but you got to hear about all the problems of all the people very seldom does a phone ever ring saying hallelujah glory to God look what the Lord has done typically the phone rings saying oh my God Highest highs and lowest lows there are to be a leader in the house of God. And these two guys, man, they really thought they, they had something going on. We'll get mama to talk to him. If you've got manipulation in you, I'm going to give you a good word of counsel. You better crucify that thing before it leads you to a place of suffering you do not want to go. Because the Lord of the house will not be manipulated by a mother or anybody else. Think about those things, leaders, aspiring leaders. When the turn, not only did it cause them suffering, but look what happened to the, their friends. When the ten heard it, they were displeased with the brothers. Kind of looked like Donald Trump and the other 15 presidential candidates right now. He said, what about me? Well, I'll tell you something about him. They were very displeased. But Jesus called them to himself and said, okay, guys, let's set a new, let's set a new paradigm. Let's set a new model of ministry. Let's, let's, you guys are still living on who's going to be in charge. Let me give you a whole new paradigm of understanding how my kingdom works. Now, in, he goes on to tell them this. You know the rulers of the Gentiles. You know the CEOs. You know the COOs. You know the managers and the supervisors. You know how the Gentiles work. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Who is in charge? Whoever has the most money. Right? 
Do you know why Donald Trump can bloviate like he does and get away with it? Because he's a billionaire. Because he doesn't have to go suck up to anybody to get enough money to put a commercial on TV. I pay for my own ad. That's why he's in charge. He's large and in charge because he's a billionaire. That's the way the world system works. Just get used to that. But in the church, it's not going to be like that. See, it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, that was everyone that just lifted your hand and said, I want to be a leader in the house of God. Now, let me just say this from experience in my own life. To even say, I believe I'm called to be a leader, you've got to have a little narcissism. You've got to believe that you can lead. You've got to have a confidence in yourself that you're right. And that's not wrong. That can be given by God. That, that God-given, you know, narcissism always seems to have a negative connotation. But you would, how would you like it if I stood up here this morning and said, y'all, I hope we're doing what's right. I really hope we do. And I'm not really sure about this God thing, but we're going to keep trying. And y'all just stay with me because I think we're going to make it. And I think there really is a heaven and a hell. What would you do? Would you be back next Sunday? You'd go, are you kidding me? But when I stand up and say, Hallelujah! I know what I know what I know. I know what the Word of God says, and I stand in confidence. She's like, now I can follow that. Now, you can call it whatever you want. Sometimes the world will label confidence as narcissistic, but there's a time where someone's given an authority by God, and you know when that authority is there, and you know when it's self-appointed. There's a difference between self-appointed and appointed by God, self-anointed and anointed by God. Whoever wants to be great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. I don't like those words. Slavery ended. Well, this is a volunteer of slavery. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The vision of a church is the institution of a government of God on earth. And it, the, the power pyramid was inverted by Christ. And he messed everything on planet earth up when his kingdom came in. He inverted the power pyramid. Man, and the world leaders hate that. They hate it. They want to be first. They don't want to be last. They want to be served. They don't want to serve. They want to be given to. They don't want to give. Are you kidding me? The kingdom of God, the church of the living God, is mankind once again submitting to the Father. And walking in his commandments. It's saying no to the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the reason of man and saying yes to obedience. I choose a king over the knowledge of right and wrong. What do you mean, Dave? It means I no longer can make a choice what is good or what is evil, but I allow my king to make that choice for me and I follow his opinion. That's what that means. See, in the, in the garden, Adam and Eve, they said, no, no, we'll do it our way. We'll do it our way. We'll choose the knowledge of good and evil instead of just obeying you. And they came out from under submission. And they no longer yielded to the will of God. But they said, we choose to walk in our own will. We'll make our own decisions. We'll decide what's right and wrong. I'm not submitting myself to anybody or to God. And that's resulted in 6,000 years of death, mayhem, wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilences. Disease and sickness and sufferings. That's what resulted from us making our own choices 
instead of just saying, you know what? I obey you. You said it's wrong, it's wrong. You said it's right, it's right. That's it. It's not rocket science. And that's what the body of Christ, that's our corporate vision, is to come in to a place of being sons. This morning, as we close, I just want to encourage every single one of you Find your personal vision. Live your personal vision. Give yourself for it. Discover it. Embrace it. Pursue it. Find your way on the earth. Be fruitful, as the scripture says, and multiply. Be a blessing and be blessed. Build strong homes and strong families. Subdue your portion of the earth. But I'd also say, find the house of God. Don't just sit in your own house, but know that there's a corporate assembly too. There's a house of God that you're supposed to belong to. Just as it's not right for a father not to come home at night, it's not right for a Christian not to come home on Sunday. Just as it's right for a mother, you know, a father sitting home with these kids and I, where's mom? Dad, I don't know. I haven't seen her. I, I haven't heard from her. She's got her cell phone turned off. No, no, a mother and a father should be home or known where they are. In the natural personal vision, in the corporate vision, I should be a part of a house of God. And I should come home when it's time to come home. Amen. I should be where I'm supposed to be. I should be faithful when I'm supposed to be faithful. A husband's supposed to be faithful to his wife. A Christian is supposed to be faithful to the church of Jesus Christ. A wife is supposed to love her husband. A Christian is supposed to love the people that God sends among them and them among. Amen? This thing of vision is bigger than both of us. It's bigger than all of us. And we just got to come in sometimes and be calibrated by the heart of God. Because it's easy to get jarred and bumped in life and lose vision. Vision leaks. It leaks. Sometimes we can get discouraged and we've got to have someone come along and say, Hey, 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 don't quit now. This will be over soon. Man, you're this close. And sometimes we need that encouragement. And sometimes we need someone to say, hey, 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 slow down here. You're trying to take shortcuts. Ain't no shortcuts with God. Let's do this honorably. Let's do this the right way. Let's let God do the work in us. Amen. Amen. Stand with me this morning. I'm going to ask my prayer team to come up here. I want to encourage you all to come back tonight for Rick Pino. I believe we're going to have a wonderful time of worship. He truly is a very, very powerful worship leader in the kingdom of God. And we're honored to have him tonight. We're blessed. And so we want you to come and have that great extended time of worship. Today, if you're in this house and you say, Dave, I've not made Jesus the Lord of my life. But I want to today. Dave, today I, I need someone to agree with me because I have not yet discovered my personal vision. Dave, today I need some help with an area in my life. Today I'm battling something and today my mind is being tormented. Today I'm having some sickness in my body. Today I need some prayer for my home. Whenever it is, if you need agreement in prayer today, I'm going to tell you, every one of these folks down here know how to pray the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith or they wouldn't be down here. Everyone down here has struggled just like you have, and they have a heart to agree and to pray. And the Bible says, let two or three come together in his name. It says, if any two agree is touching anything on earth, it shall be done by my Father. That's why we have prayers of agreement. Because God honors it. God honors when we pray. Scripture says you have not because you ask not. Well, come and ask. Come and ask. 
We love you today and we bless you. If you need prayer, come and get prayer. You can come right now. We'll be here. We won't, these folks won't leave until it's done. As long as someone needs prayer, we'll be here to pray for you. We love you and bless you. I want you to have an awesome week in the Lord. Have an awesome, awesome week in the Lord. Be blessed.